Hi, everyone. I'm Lucy Siegel. I am a journalist, a writer and a broadcaster, and I specialise in climate and nature stories. Welcome to the Be a Net Zero Hero podcast, part of the Be the Change series of conversations organised by One Carbon World in collaboration with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now, One Carbon World is a climate positive not-for-profit organisation and an official observer organisation of the UNFCCC. They're registered in the UK and have operations in over 32 countries, offering advice and support on measuring, reducing and rebalancing the emissions of small and large organisations. Now, COP28 will be a milestone moment when the world will take stock of its progress on the Paris Agreement. The first global stock take will provide a comprehensive assessment of progress since adopting the Paris Agreement. Now, this will help align efforts on climate action, including measures that need to be put into place to bridge the gaps in progress. And we know there are a few of those. Bridging the gap is a crucial step in this effort. In the last two years, One Carbon World has been focusing on the transition to net zero, creating the conditions for cutting greenhouse gas emissions to as close to zero as possible, with any remaining emissions reabsorbed from the atmosphere by activities such as forestry and regenerative agriculture. Ultimately, their goal is to bring sustainable development to multiple countries and their local communities with clear social, environmental and economic benefits involved. As every year, One Carbon World is attending this UN summit. Now, they have showcased inspirational stories at COP25 in Madrid, COP26 in Glasgow, that was my favourite, and COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh. They've also had the honour to measure the emissions of COP27 and issue the official COP27 verification report and COP27 sustainability report for the Egyptian government. This year, they want to show the world their journey towards net zero and would love to tell you some more inspirational stories too. Now, this first episode is called Sports and Sustainable Events. It's an exciting topic with the 2024 Paris Olympics in less than a year. Can you believe it? Okay, now we all know that sport brings millions of us across the globe together in a way that nothing else can. Collectively, we're going to learn more about how sports and top sporting events can display climate leadership by engaging together in the climate neutrality journey. Now, before we invite our first guests, I want to have a chat with Steve Kenzie, Executive Director at the UN Global Compact Network UK, who will tell us more about their work surrounding sustainable development goals and their support to businesses and organisations. Welcome, Steve. Thank you for joining us today. How are you? Hi, Lucy. Um, I'm well, thank you very much. And thanks for having me uh, on the programme. It's great to have you. You're a little bit hesitant about saying you were well then, but I hope you are. You seem like you are. Okay, we'd love to know a little bit more about the UN Global Compact Network. What is it and how can organisations join this network? I'll start by talking about the, the bigger picture, the UN Global Compact. We are the largest corporate sustainability initiative globally. There's more than 23,000 participants in the initiative It's a UN-backed corporate sustainability initiative. It started in 2000 when then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan saw the problems of globalization where we had companies shifting production to developing countries in pursuit of lower costs, but they weren't shifting standards around working conditions and business practices along with them. And and we had some real problems with... um, children making footballs uh those of us of an age will remember the, those scandals he recognized that we needed a global standard for responsible business and he had a brilliant insight that we could draw from existing un agreements that had already been accepted around the world and so the un global compact has as its foundation 
10 universal principles that have been drawn from UN treaties in the areas of human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. Our work is to work with our participants to help inspire greater ambition, give them skills and knowledge to enable action around that ambition, and we seek to shape the wider environment for sustainability. To join us is very simple. The CEO of the organization, however large or small, wherever it's located, just needs to make um, three commitments. Firstly, to operationalize our 10 principles throughout their organizations, to report annually on the progress that they're making towards doing so, and finally, to support the wider UN development agenda, which is best expressed right now by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Amazing. Thank you for such a clear um, guide to what you do and why you do it. And I, I'm always struck when um, initiatives just build on the framework that's already there and make it really, really easy for people to join. So let's drill down a little bit. How can businesses help promote sustainable development, um, relieve poverty and preserve and protect the environment? We often talk about that trio of missions, don't we? And it's really easy to slip into asking businesses to be things that they're not. And, and we're very careful about that. And what we're advocating for, there's always a business case. So I, I think there's nothing wrong with doing the right thing. And we'd love to see more of that. But in so many of the areas where we work, doing the right thing also comes with business benefits. Um, Business can have a really profound impact on, on development and on society just by operating in a responsible way. For example, on gender equality, a really big issue. Um, the, the rate of change on gender is, is really shockingly slow. Estimates said it 160 years to achieve um, gender equality at the rate we're going. But there's loads of evidence that shows diverse businesses perform better. So there's a really clear business case for business to embrace the sustainable development goals, embrace the target of achieving gender equality much more rapidly. The, the, the SDGs say, let's do it by 2030. And so we have a, a campaign called um, Forward Faster, where we are calling on companies to step up and adopt that goal. In other areas around relieving poverty, business is great at creating wealth, at creating jobs, um, but we can't just have any jobs. We can't have people working and, and still being in poverty. There's a well-established standard here in the UK and globally, the idea of a living wage, where people are paid enough that they can actually have a, have a good life um, on that standard. So we're calling upon companies to pay their employees and employees through their supply chains a living wage. And there's a very strong evidence that there are business benefits to doing so. Reductions in turnover, higher productivity of staff, happier staff, all makes for a more successful business. It's not always intuitive. Spending more, more money on staff is, is going to pay returns, but the evidence is there and is borne out that it works. You make a very compelling argument, but you do also um, you, you face up to the fact that, you know, there is very slow, sometimes very halting progress on this. So let's talk about the challenges for businesses in terms of sustainable, uh, sustainable development. Um, kind of what are they and how can businesses raise awareness about voluntary climate action and how can they inspire others? I think business needs to, you know, play to their strengths and um, and where there is a business case, business needs to push for it. Most companies now, and we're seeing a lot of action where um, companies are pushing through their supply chain and making uh, demands upon their supplier companies to raise their ambitions and, and contribute as well. It, it's just a it's just a fact that this is the direction that the world is going in. Maybe not as fast as we'd like to, but net zero is 
inevitable. It's it's inconceivable that 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 we we don't adopt that future. And so companies need to recognize the strong business case for getting ahead of the curve, taking action now, starting to make progress now, recognizing that it will be more effective and less expensive in the long run to act now and make these changes. Let's future-proof our businesses and wider our societies um, by becoming more sustainable on climate and on, on social issues as well. Thank you. As I say, a very uh, compelling case. Um, and this is so important for so many businesses and individuals out there who really want to embark on voluntary climate action. Some of them don't know where to start. I mean, that's that's the that's the truth. So um, we really, really value your very inspiring work, Stephen. Thank you for making the time um, to talk to us today. And we're looking forward to hearing more about your network soon. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, well, Steve's got us off to a flying start um, and let's meet our first guests. And they're gonna be speaking, remember, about sports and sustainability, the Olympics, Paris 2024. Okay, here we go. I'm very excited about this. From World Sailing, we have Alexandra Rickham, who is the double Paralympic sailing bronze medalist and five times world champion and now head of sustainability at World Sailing. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about World Sailing. It is the um, world governing body for the sport of sailing, officially recognized by the International Olympic Committee, better known as the IOC. World Sailing takes sustainability sustainability very seriously and in fact is considered a leading international federation when it comes to promoting voluntary climate action at every stage of the sport. I think that's really important to know. Um, uh, as well as Alexandra, we also have from the International Biathlon Union, Rika Rakic, Head of Sustainability. Now the International Biathlon Union is the international governing body of biathlon and is committed to making its operations and activities fully sustainable along all three dimensions of sustainability. Those are environmental, social and economic, as we know. The IBU has committed to ambitious climate goals by 2030, again in alignment with Paris Agreement. Uh, welcome to Rika. And from the International Table Tennis Federation, we have Karine Tao, who is head of sustainability there. Let me tell you about the International Table Tennis Federation. It's the governing body for all national table tennis associations. And at the core of their vision is making table tennis accessible to everyone for life and for generations to come putting people, planet and prosperity at the heart of everything they do. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Are you thanks there? for having us. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us, Lucy. <laughs> I am delighted you're here. OK, we're going to start with a question for all of you. Uh, the UNF Triple C Paris Agreement, as we know, an international treaty on climate change, and it was signed in Paris in 2015, sets out obligations for countries to mitigate the effects of climate change. That's what it's designed to do. Now, we have the Olympics next year in Paris as well. And since sport is key, as we all know, do you have any sustainability plans in place for the 2024 Paris Olympic Games? And what will be the role of athletes in this? I always think that's such a fascinating question. OK, let's start with Alexandra first, if we may. Uh, sure. So Paris 2024, um, the organising committee are obviously leading all the major efforts around the games themselves. And uh, they have a huge focus on sustainability. And it's, I genuinely think it's going to be like we've never seen before from, you know, the reports that we've been getting. So that's super exciting to have an organizing committee who are committed to, to doing this. But from that international federation perspective, so from our perspective, um, we're hoping to have as many staff as possible travel by train. So obviously we know that travel and transport is like one of our big areas. In fact, it's the biggest uh, area that we have um, a footprint in, in terms of our carbon footprint. Uh, but also sailing will be taking place in Marseille. So uh, we're going to see for the first time uh, the use of decarbonized, like a decarbonized fleet of boats as part of the support. So it's going to be some electric boats, robotic marks. Uh, so again, and that will all be charged using renewable energy. 
So that's all preparing at the games. And then for the athletes, we're hoping to offer more education in the run up to the games so that they feel that they can discuss and talk and with validity and with authenticity whilst they're there, if they have strong feelings about, um, you know, certain climate actions. Um, and also we hope, you know, that we can influence their choices around transport and travel as well, wherever possible. So that's, that's kind of our, our big focus going into 24. That sounds great. I mean, literally electrifying. Um, that would be yeah. great. I, I live actually on the River Thames or near the River Thames. And I have seen the emergence of electric boats, especially over the last year, which is very, very welcome. I also love your focus on giving athletes confidence to talk about this issue. Um, I think that's super, super important to build the language and indeed the confidence um, so that they can really, you know, really face up to this issue. Um, thank you very much for that. Corrine, let's come to you and hear what, what plans you've got or you know about so far. Hey, thanks a lot, Lucy. Um, so just to put it in context, we signed the UNFCCC um, Support for Climate Action Framework, which means we're committed uh, to reducing our footprint by 50% by 2030 as an organization and working towards net zero by 2040. So that's us as an organization. And I think as Alexandra mentioned before, um, there's a difference between Paris LOC, the organizing committee who's leading um, the work on sustainability for, for Paris 24 and us as an organization reducing our footprint and, and our collaboration with Paris 24. Um, so I'm really impressed so far with what I've seen from Paris. There are things happening on on a catering where I think they're reducing and offering ve more vegetarian options. Um, they're they're looking at a second life. They're looking at having all sites I think accessible by bike, uh, but maybe Ben <laughs> knows more about that. Um, they have school program to getting people more physically active and healthy, and they also have one thing that's really important for us as well is um a climate a coach climate, which is like a an online area where they can when event organizers can long term learn to reduce their footprint and that would be more accessible to everyone using doing events in France, a single use plastic van. So they so they have quite a lot of actions that we're really looking forward to learning from as well. Um, but of course in the collaboration we look specifically at table tennis and how table tennis will be affected. Um, and we're a new signatory. So for us it's one of the first times we're in discussion with the LOC on this area. So of course there's also travel by plane. Um, but, and travel by train, sorry, uh, with it being in France, it'll be very interesting to see how that is done. But on our side, we also have reduction of um, international technical officials, some of these changing to national ones. Um, so this means optimizing the schedule, changing, um, looking at how the competition works and, and looking to increase the national technical officials instead of international ones to reduce travel. Um, discussions on what happened after all the equipment and the afterlife. We also have a lounge, and I think all federations have a lounge, and looking at what we could do there, and also uniform. These are also things that we control and we have an impact, direct impact on. And uh, looking at also what we could do with um, athlete education so they can have a snowball effect, and and, um, and that's all we're working on for now. But it's a working a progress. Lot. <laughs> you are doing a lot. Um, yes, Ben will be coming up shortly and we'll hear more about that, as you mentioned. Um, I really like the way that you zone in on the lessons and the collaboration and the way that we, you know, maybe we'll do events. We, we will almost certainly do events differently in the future. And obviously there's takeaways there for lots of other industries, music, media, definitely. So um, looking forward to that as well. Um, Rika, let's come to you. Now, as a winter sport, biathlon will not be part of the 2024 Paris Olympic Games. Um, so we, we, we are acknowledging that, obviously. Uh, but since sport will be key for meeting those commitments, let's discuss how you and the global biathlon family are working to contribute to these goals. Yes, thank you. This is correct. We won't be part of the games in Paris, but we will be obviously working our way to Milano Cortina in 26, so just two years after. So it means that we are not sitting on our laurels. We we need to keep working um, on our own sport at the moment. Um, so that means we also like sailing and table tennis have committed ourselves to the same uh, goals of being uh, reducing our footprint by 50% by 2030 and being net zero in 2040. So that means that we're already reaching out to our family stakeholders. Uh, that Most of that 
work needs to be with our event. We, we really see that our events are the biggest sources of carbon emissions. So we are great believers in measuring and what you don't man- measure, you can manage. So we also have created our own tool to measure carbon footprint of our events and working very closely with our organizing committees around the world to really address the issues they have, because obviously the opportunities for reduction will be very different depending on where you are, what options you have in terms of public transportation, uh, making changes uh, to where to the ways that you organize your event. But I think we talked about the athletes earlier and the importance of education. And that's another focus area for us. We have a group of athlete ambassadors, sustainability athlete ambassadors, who obviously we are training. But we, we also think that it's important to reach out to the entire athlete body. So most recently, we've actually been working with uh, the brands, the brands that provide the equipment to the athletes. Uh, they have a little different uh, relationship with the athletes. So we are hoping that they will join us in this uh, uh, call to educate the athletes, to make them feel comfortable to speak up, to be advocates for climate action. Um, and that's been a big focus for us th- this autumn because our season is just about to start. Um, and we think that we can we can not do um, any, any less than uh, educate everyone in the stakeholder groups. Brilliant. I love that very smart play, if I may borrow from sport, where you're, you know, uh, teaming up with or another sport, sporting pun with the brands. Very, very um, interesting, very innovative as well. Um, thank you to all of you. That was fascinating. And hopefully we can get into some more of the detail um, on this. What we're really taking away is that we all have a role to play. We also know the importance of inspiring sustainability and involving the younger generations. Um, So let's see what the younger generations have to say. Uh, That's why we've invited the pupils of Falkirk High School in Scotland to ask you a question. Over to them. Hi, my name is James. I'm a pupil from Falkirk High School, Scotland. I have a question for you. Why are major sporting events such as Paris 2024 and Milano Cortina 2026, the next Winter Olympic Games, important for the planet? Okay, so the question from Falkirk High School, why are major sporting events such as Paris 2024 or Milano Cortina 2026, the next Olympic Winter Games, important for the planet? What a great question. Corrine, let's uh, let's go to you first. What do you think? Uh, thanks a lot for the question. Um, not sure if it's important for the planet, but rather the, the planet's important for the sport and we therefore need to also take care of the planet. Um, I think what's interesting with such big sport, bigger sporting events like um, Paris 24 and Milano is it's major multi-sport. So in terms of, of reach and impact it's huge and it's a bit like this podcast where we have cycling sailing biathlon um these are all elements in nature and it's one of the things with um indoor sports such as table tennis where for us the awareness is something that we really need to to push still and uh, we still have a lot of education and if we look at climate change and where we come from we used to call it global warming and that that was a bit of a challenge because it was being challenged and people were saying oh but it's not warming the planet which I think there was a misunderstanding on on science and there's a lot of fake news and lobbying against um, climate change, which is something that sport can also definitely have a huge role on. And I think Paris 24 is definitely playing its part in that. And and that's something that we should continue to push um, on many levels. And I think the importance of these events is more the impact and the reach that they can have because it's, it's has a global reach and it can have a huge impact on, on, decisions and and influence in terms of explaining and educating and ensuring that we can take concrete actions and walking the walk as well. I like your focus. I like your strength. Very, very good. Okay, um, let's come to Alexandra now. So that question, why are major sporting events like the ones coming up important for the planet? Or is the planet important for them, as as Karine pointed out? So for my sport, it's definitely that the planet is important for us because at the end of the day, we're dependent on nature. So, you know, if we have an unhealthy planet, we're not we're not winning from a sailing perspective. And it's I know it's the same for Rika as well in the winter sports. It's you know, we're we are in a state of emergency. Um, But I think uh, the games are super important because, you know, 
like Karina was saying, they, they have the ability to lead from the front. You know, they have the ability to influence the athletes, the teams and all of the fans. You know, like you're not, you know, you don't see such big broadcast events for sport. So this is the opportunity. They can tell all of the stories about the planet, about climate action, and they can use sport as that platform for change. And I think that's what's really cool, you know, and the reality about an Olympics is what I love, what I personally love about an Olympics is the fact that you have such a diversity of, of people in such a diverse range of sports, you know, so every shape and size of person can inspire somebody. And, and I think being able to use, uh, you know, the athletes and, and the games to be able to use their voice, to be able to, to show that everybody has a part to play is incredibly important. So, um, yeah, that's the value for me in terms of, of, of the games and the importance of the planet. Yeah, and you're so right. You know, I remember London 2012 so clearly because before I had no concept, but there are athletes everywhere from all over the place. It, the, the diversity and the energy is just unforgettable. So I'm, I can't wait for the people of Paris to experience this. I really can't. Okay, Rika, um, let's come to you. And, you know, as we just heard, your sport, you are nature. Nature is you. There's no divide. Yes, and our sport, winter sport, is extremely dependent on a certain type of climate. We recently conducted a study among our athletes, and indeed three quarters of them said that they already noticed the impact of climate change on their daily lives. They see they're very concerned about not only uh, their own training, but more importantly about the training opportunities, access to snow by younger generations, because where they used to grow up and actually came involved with, with their sport, it, it's no longer possible to actually train on snow. They don't have snow there anymore. Our winters have come, become so short. And we understand that winter sport is only something that exists in uh, one third of the, the globe. Uh, so we realize it might be looking exotic, but we also are very concerned about the future of our sport. So we feel that Milano Cortina, the Winter Games, is such a platform. It only comes every four years. We're running out of time here, but it, it will be very important for us and our athletes to be able to speak up uh, because we cannot change the, the direction of uh, travel alone. We need the help of everyone uh, to realize that if we don't do something now, it'll be late too soon. Well said, absolutely. Um, thank you so much to the pupils uh, from Falkirk. Thank you. And I hope that you enjoyed the answer and thank you for your provocative question. Um, okay, we've got a, another question for each of you now because I'm sure our listeners and viewers are very interested in knowing a bit more about your organisations as well. Um, Alexandra, could you tell us a little bit more about your sustainability agenda for 2030 and why you think that this is key for a governing body uh, such as World Sailing? Uh, well, I guess uh, for us, Agenda 2030 is, has very much become like our North Star, um, you know, so it's driving sustainability, but actually is it's how we want to operate in terms of what, you know, in our wider terms. So it's ingrained throughout every aspect of kind of what we're doing. And it's also to get across the point to our staff and, you know, within our organization and our wider reach that everybody has a responsibility. It's just because I'm the head of sustainability doesn't mean that it's all about me telling other people what to do. It's actually about everybody taking ownership. So that's part of it. But the agenda itself, um, just to give a bit of insight, we have 56 environmental and social targets, uh, which are across, or which are time bound. So that's really important that we have time stamps on them. And they're across all of our key operational areas. So this can, this includes essentially everything um, from in considering the impacts of our events, our clubs, our classes, through to our choices of Olympic equipment, through to the specific targets, uh, such as that we have for race officials and getting gender parity, you know, and it also helps inform how we develop and how we're going to push forward in terms of participation, you know, simple things like how are we going to get race, how are we going to get that gender parity? We need to make sure that we're developing people at the beginnings of our journey. So it's all it's all of this is wrapped up in our sustainability agenda. And it's you know, it's it's who we are basically at this point. Love it. I hope everyone's listening to that. These are, these are the goals that you set, these firm goals, and you drive through and you look at it really holistically. It's such a brilliant approach. Um, and indeed, a similar approach 
has also been adopted by the International Biathlon Union or the IBU. So Rika, let's talk about the IBU. So um, you've invited a leading group of experts to join its Sustainability Expert Reference Group, ERG. Tell us more about this experience and how it can help other sports organisations achieve their goals. Yeah, thank you. I must first acknowledge though the work that Broad Sailing has done. Uh, Alexandra and her team uh, have been leading also our thinking and are definitely um, a guide for us, everyone else in the sport. But we also realized that sport might be a little bit behind the curve here. Um, and we felt it was important that when we were working on our plan, we involved experts from outside our own um family. So we invited uh, individuals that were experts either in social sustainability or in climate science or in communication and awareness. Um, so that was the group of people that we initially brought in to just help us make sure that whatever we, we created our own strategy, it's also a 10 year plan, uh, that we were we were on meeting the, the requirements not of today, but also those in 10 years time or 2030. So that was a great start for us. More recently, we've now then created another sustainability commission is what we call it, because now that we have to, the strategy is three years old, now we have to implement it. We have to walk the talk, but we cannot do it alone. So we've, we've realized that we need to draw on the expertise of people in the different national federations and our other stakeholders now that we are actually in the, in the next step of our, our plan. Okay, thank you. Again, that story of collaboration and reaching out and having lenses that are not necessarily from, a, from your own industry is very, very inspiring to me personally. Um, okay, so these initiatives are really getting the message across and, and that's a key part of climate action. Um, Kareen, one of your mottos is table tennis for all, for life, forever. Tell us a bit more about that very stirring mantra and how this connects with your sustainability agenda. Thanks. Um, so Table Tennis for All for Life has been ITTF's motto for, for years now. And um, the foundations is Table Tennis for All for a Better Life. Um, and so when we were thinking about sustainability, I think we were speaking a lot about future and future generations. And this is where um, Forever came from. Um, it came mainly from our leadership uh, and their awareness of, of where we're positioning sustainability and looking more holistically in terms of people, planet and prosperity. Um, so not only climate, which is currently our focus, because that's where we're starting off. So we're also um, being challenged and, and benefiting and learning a lot from all the other federations. Um, so world sailing is... <laughs> Uh, we're playing catch up, <laughs> uh, biathlon, cycling, which is really great because they've done so much work that we can we can learn a lot from them. And the IOC has been leading and supporting as well. Um, so I think it's 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 a space where we have a lot of co collaboration and learning and exchange to see, because we have the same enemy, which is this emergency on the climate, and and we're there's more collaboration than maybe other sports where it's more competitive that sports want to be better and i think there's this growing understanding that we need to work together to ensure that our sports can take place in the future and can continue for the next generations um for health and for well-being and for enjoyment um and i think this is kind of what what it embraces as well it's that it's for all and we have to make sure that it's accessible for all but it's also that we're ensuring that we're responsible about how we're using the resources we're using and we're accountable for our actions. Amazing. Just on the idea of table tennis for all, big shout out to my parents-in-law, John and Linda, who have bought, invested in a table tennis table and their whole neighborhood now is permanently playing on this thing. So there you are. I don't think they consider themselves elite sports people, but I, I want you to know that they are taking it very seriously. Um, and I think we're all getting the message that World Sailing is very much the gold star organization. Uh, we bow down to everything that you're doing. Um, fantastic. Um, okay. I mean, this has been a really, really super interesting conversation. Thank you so much to all of you for uh, taking the time to answer our questions and for your stories and insight, which we will not forget and we will take on and use. Um, we're now looking forward even more than ever to Paris 2024 and Milano Cortina 2026 to see how these um, initiatives come to life. 
But before we move on to the next guests, let's listen to some inspirational organisations and um, understand a bit more about their work towards climate voluntary action. We'll be back in just a minute. At Robertson, our purpose is to assure a sustainable future. In addition to decarbonising our own operations, we work closely with our customers and our project teams to deliver sustainable projects. With low and net zero carbon solutions implemented across the whole project lifecycle, we have delivered excellent outcomes, including the UK's largest hydrogen fuel cell installation, the first all-electric hospital in Scotland and the first Passive House Primary School in Scotland. OK, we're now moving on to the second part of this episode where we will discuss sustainability and big sporting events. I would like to welcome John Suha, who is Vice President Environmental and Social Impact at the World Surf League. World Surf League is the global home of competitive surfing and is committed to protecting our ocean and beaches, embracing a sustainable ethos. It's a cause very close to my heart. I've been um, a trustee of Surfers Against Sewage in the UK uh, for many years. So I've had the fortune to know to get to know many surfers. Earlier this year, WSL launched the WSL One Ocean Initiative to inspire, educate and empower ocean lovers. I think it's really, really powerful. We're also happy to have Ben Barrett joining us today. Ben is sustainability consultant at the Union Cycliste Internationale, UCI, and that's the world governing body of cycling, recognized by the International Olympic Committee and founded in Paris over 122 years ago. So a venerable institution indeed. Um, welcome both and thank you for being here. Thanks, Lucy. It's great to be back. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start with a general question for both of you, if that's OK. So the UN Sports for Climate Action Framework aims at supporting and guiding sports actors in achieving global climate change goals. Um, but could you tell us more about this framework and why did your organisation choose to become a signatory? Ben, let's start with you. So the Sports for Climate Action Framework brings together sports organisations, both big and small, to learn from each other make collective decisions and push the entire industry's ambition at speed and scale. It's got two distinct aims. The first is to reduce sports greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the second is to leverage sports cultural influence to mainstream global action on climate change. The UCI signed the uh, framework back in 2020 because it is the ideal forum for us to learn from other sports organizations, also to share best practices and collaborate on the shared challenges we face. It's really cool to hear about um, an organization with the standing and history of yours, be so open to collaboration and learning from other organizations. I really think that's a, a really big part of this. Um, John, let's get your thoughts about the framework too. Definitely. And thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here talking about sports and environmental impact. You know, I think sport really has the power to unite and inspire people in such a unique way. And that makes us really a proud participant in the Sports for Climate Action framework. This framework really provides sports organizations like the World Surf League with an opportunity to display climate leadership and commitments by engaging together in various climate actions. And for us, it's really a great forum to pursue these climate actions in a consistent and mutually supportive way. You know, as a signatory, I think we're really committed to aligning to the entire Sports for Climate Action framework and all of their principles. And some of those guidelines and targets, you know, really helped us to reduce our emissions by 49% and reduce our waste by 70% from our 2018 baseline. And the Sports for Climate Action framework also helps to incentivize climate action beyond the sports sector. Um, so we're seeing it driving global ambition and commitments, inspiring others to step up on their climate goals and their climate targets. You know, we really have the opportunity to learn from one another, other signatories and, you know, other organizations outside of the sports sector to share best practices, to develop new tools, to collaborate on areas of mutual interest. And we ultimately chose to become a signatory because 
The ocean is quite literally our arena. It's our office, it's our inspiration, and it's directly impacted by climate change. The future of not just professional surfing, but all of surfing and all of water sports and water activities are directly tied to the health of the global ocean. So we wanna ensure that the ocean is healthy for generations of surfers, fans, aspiring athletes, and everyone to come. This is very interesting. By the way, we've invited the pupils of another high school, in this case, the Breeze High School in Scotland, to ask all of you a question about sports and climate action. So let's see what they have to say. Hi, my name is Jessica Thompson and I'm from Breeze High School in Scotland and I have a question for you. What can we do differently to help our school sport and events? Okay, there you go. What can we do differently for our school's sporting events? So flipping round your knowledge onto them. This is a very, very interesting question. And Ben, what would you advise these pupils to do? It is a great question. Well, you can encourage everyone, especially parents, to make sure that they take sustainable travel to your sports events. You know, things like walking, cycling, wheeling, and public transport. When there's lots of cars in the same place at the same time, it causes congestion, air pollution, and it makes it less safe for people who are trying to get there by active travel. You can also, um, at your sports days, host cycling for all side events. You know, this could be bike activities for smaller kids, could be maintenance classes, cycle skills training, or workshops about active travel and the bike library options in your area. Um, if you want to know how to host one of those events, head to the UCI's website and look at the Cycling for All resources. Thank you. Very clear instruction there. I think the pupils will like that a lot. John, let's come to you and get your take. That's a really great question. And, you know, here at WSL, I think we firmly believe that every single action that we take matters and that we're stronger when we organize together and when we collaborate with one another. Even if it feels small or insignificant, your individual actions can really add up to create global change and create these massive ripple effects. So first, at school sporting events, we would encourage students to carpool, to take public transit. If you're close enough, you could walk or consider biking like I do with some of my kids. Um, you can dispose of trash properly by abiding by your school's waste management system. Um, you know, what goes in compost, compost. What can be recycled, recycled. And anything else that needs to go to landfill, try to reduce it, um, but put it in the respective bins. And then if possible, where you can try to bring reusables, whether it's water bottles, cutlery, bags, to really avoid single-use plastic that might be harder to recycle. And then secondly, we think schools are, you know, a part of a greater community, and each has its own unique needs and challenges. So at the WSL, we partner with grassroots organizations and indigenous communities to educate us about unique solutions in each market that each community needs to protect and conserve their ecosystems. So schools and students can play a vital part in their own communities by working with these local organizations and volunteering their time to uplift these efforts that are happening in your own neighborhoods. It could be something like participating in restoration activities, learning about marine wildlife conservation, or even volunteering at your local community garden. You know, every individual effort counts. And like I said, can add up to create these ripple effects of change. Okay, we also have some questions for each of you, as we'd love to hear more about um, your specific stories. So let's start with UCI. Ben, what has changed since last year in terms of your sustainability plans? And have you achieved any significant milestones that you would like to share with us? Well, we've been really busy since last year and the last time I was on this podcast, um, developing some key initiatives and tools to help our stakeholders to take climate action. In February, we launched UCI Climate Action Training. Now, this is a two-hour online webinar with vital, science-based, solution-centric information to help our stakeholders reduce the impacts of the sport of cycling and, most importantly, contribute to sustainable development worldwide. Then in August, during the 2023 UCI Cycling World Championships held in Glasgow and across Scotland, we launched the UCI Sustainability Impact Tracker. This is an online platform where 
all of our stakeholders, the professional teams, event organizers, the national federations can measure their impacts. They can develop action plans, monitor progress, communicate transparently and contribute to the global climate agenda. Then in October, the UCI published its first sustainability report. So these are updates on our progress against the first set of objectives that we set ourselves. It also includes our climate transition plan, and that's the roadmap for how the UCI will achieve its 50% emissions reductions by 2030. We've also published our Agenda 2030 Sustainability Strategy. Now, these are targets for the UCI to achieve by the end of the decade in conjunction with all our stakeholders. And it's also a roadmap for and timeframe on when we will achieve them. Wow, you haven't wasted any time at all. Ben is obviously a friend of the podcast returning. And when you get a snapshot of someone's year and it is so full, I'm always slightly lost for words, but I think probably that's the pace of action we need to see everywhere, right? Yeah, very, Absolutely. very impressive. Very impressive. Um, on your training that you devised, the two hour um, uh, a training module, I guess, did you do that specially? Did you have to sort of curate that from scratch or were you able to build on an existing program? Well, that's the beauty of Sports for Climate Action. There's lots of amazing resources that other sports organizations have published. And what we've done is bring it all together and create that story to help our stakeholders navigate the complexities of this issue. Um, we've now trained over 350 people from 31 countries. And this is another benefit of taking it online. And uh, we've also translated the training into French and Italian. Uh, we are looking to make this publicly available to the other international federations and Sports for Climate Action signatories uh, later on in this year. Really, really great work. Thank you. Um, John, while many organizations are just concentrating on measuring their emissions, World Surf League has said Set up an amazing initiative called One Ocean. Why did you set it up? So we like to say that the ocean is our arena, it's our office, it's our playground, and most importantly, it's our inspiration. So the future of not just professional surfing, but all surfing is directly tied to the health of the global ocean. And our league initiative, WSL One Ocean, was set up to provide us with an ongoing platform and engagement that has allowed us to interact with and learn from conservationists, ocean advocates, and just stakeholder communities all over the world. It's also at the forefront of our priorities to engage and inspire our athletes and fans to get involved and join us. So we try to leverage our global broadcast, our editorial articles, our social media channels, and even marketing to continue to educate and celebrate this great work, placing our athletes and surfers at the center of these stories um, and including WSL One Ocean activations at each of our events, these local community projects um, that are really grassroots and really valuable. And another fun example of this is our Speak Up for the Ocean campaign, which launched on World Ocean Day earlier this year and continued on throughout our season. Um, so here within this campaign, we asked athletes, influencers, community leaders, and fans around the world to join us and share their individual stories, those individual sustainable initiatives or actions that they're taking on social media using a hashtag WSL1Ocean or the hashtag SpeakUpForTheOcean. And we were able to collaborate with organizations like the United Nations, to leverage the power and the voice of our athletes and, and surfers, you know, to engage fans across the world, to really think about sustainable actions that they can take on an individual level. And, you know, I think if we want to continue to see the community and the sport of surfing thrive, we need to protect our ocean and help elevate the work of environmental stewards and indigenous communities at each tour stop where we have events. And, you know, we've been doing this conser uh, conservation work uh, more recently over the last, you know, 10, 20 years here, but indigenous communities and local stakeholders have been doing it for thousands of years. Um, and another pillar of this is our work with WSL Pure and the WSL Pure grant program, which helps to amplify the work even further by funding these critical nonprofit initiatives from organizations on the ground where our events take place. And we've had the opportunity to partner on projects that range, range from coral reef restoration in, to, in Tahiti 
to really innovative and dynamic river barriers and intercept solutions in Indonesia and El Salvador and Brazil. Um, so we're seeing that the work these organizations are doing, it's really changing the world and we're honored to have an opportunity to fund it and to see you know, the change that we can elevate on a local level. And for those that are interested in learning a little bit more about this campaign and this initiative, feel free to visit WSL1Ocean.org. Well, congratulations to both of you on these initiatives. And I'd also like to say a big thank you for taking part in this episode and for showing how sport is at the core of sustainability and climate action. We're all excited and looking forward to learning more about your events soon. Thank you both for your time. OK, we've reached the end of our first episode of this Be A Net Zero Hero podcast. Can't believe that went very fast. Um, I'd like to thank every single one of you for listening and following this great conversation. So we've just learned a fantastic examples on how sport and big sporting events can lead by example and help save our planet. Um, this is also proof that we all have a role to play in helping mitigate the effects of climate change as much as we can. Now, please remember, you can follow these conversations on Spotify, YouTube and Amazon Music. In our next episode, we will be talking about nature-based solutions and carbon removals, a fantastic topic indeed. So we hope to see you there and thank you again for your time. Mm -hmm.